and saw our better selves. It's hard to imagine it's 16 years later. Um, you know, I was just telling uh, my, my team over here that I every time I hear that montage song that was put together, Jason, I know you did this years ago, it just gives me goosebumps. And everybody's, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I've already got text. Oh, I, I, I will need a copy of that. We'll put it up on the website. We'll try and play it later in the program as well today. Um, it is an amazing, sobering thing to hear all of that to me every time. And I was I was texting and emailing with a, a friend before the show today, and I'm like, you know, this person was in third grade at the time that this happened, remembers the name of the teacher, what was going on, what happened. And, you know, my daughter was born on August 29th, 2001, just a few days, obviously, before this happens. It's just... I remember that day like it's yesterday, and it all comes rushing back, the memories. You know, it's um, I, I, I wrote a book after this in 2004, Deliver Us From Evil. It is such a hard thing for good people to wrap their arms around, around the concept that there really is evil. But there is. There is there's darkness. There are people that, for whatever reason, you know, when— when evil calls itself a martyr, it just captures everything that line in Michael W. Smith's song. That is what radical Islamists, they they call, they think they're martyrs. They they tell their kids, drop bombs on you, go kill, go get yourself 72 virgins in heaven. It's pretty amazing that you can be so sick, so disgustingly twisted and evil. You know, but you think of a lot of human evil. I remember walking through the history of human evil in that book saying, all right, there's a hundred plus million souls that were slaughtered in the last hundred years of human history. Nazi Germany was evil. Nazism, evil. Fascism, evil. You know, the former Soviet Union under Stalin is evil. Radical Islam is evil. You know, the, the latest evil, here you got a saber rattling madman you know, known as Kim Jong-un, following in the heels of his father, Kim Jong-il, you know, now has nuclear weapons because we are so stupid. Bill Clinton said, well, this is a good deal for the American people. Now, it's not a good deal to give despots, this guy's father, billions of dollars uh, with the promise that all of a sudden they're going to be good. There are some people that are never going to be good, and the only thing they seemingly understand is the use of force. And it's hard for people to grasp that. You know, you think on just a local human level. Um, isn't murder to some extent just pure evil? And I'm not talking about self-defense. I'm talking about, you know, somebody that can is so addicted to drugs they can, you know, beat up a grandmother or shoot an innocent person and kill the innocent person or paralyze an innocent person. Or how does how does anybody abuse a child in life? That's evil. Or the rape of a woman is pure evil. And people have this on a small level, and governments have it at a large level. You know, America's creed has always been a stand-up for goodness. And I think back to that day, and I think back, it's such a shock. You know, then look at, look at the issue of billions and billions and billions of dollars transported to Iranian mullahs in the, with the promise that they're not going to spin their centrifuges and they're going to allow inspections it's it's a bad memory. It's like what part of of the North Korean deal didn't you understand to do something that stupid? And we're going to end up one day in the same situation we now find ourselves with North Korea. There's no good options. You know, the next thing that's probably going to happen is you're going to see the North Koreans fire another ICBM or another missile that they want to fire over Japan and more saber rattling. Oh, they'll shoot this one towards Guam. And America's going to have to take that sucker out of the sky. It's going to happen. That's probably the next step. That would be what I'd anticipate. And then what's he going to do then? And, it, you know, as Newt said, how do we know the next missile he puts on the launch pad doesn't have a nuke on it? We have to assume the worst unless this guy opens the door for inspections, which I don't see happening. So then the result is, all right, we're going to take out his nuclear sites. We're going to take these missiles off of the launching pad. And then what is he going to do? Is he going to, you know, attack South Korea? Is he going to fire a missile, a real missile, a nuclear weapon at Japan or China? And there's no good options here. 
And that's there's going to be no good options with Iran either. North Korea today warning the U.S. of the greatest pain if the sanctions pass. All right, that's great. Also a, a headline in the U.K. Telegraph, North Korea is secretly helped by by Iran to gain nuclear weapons, according to British officials. North Korea may launch another ballistic missile tomorrow. And experts warn as Kim Jong-un plans to celebrate the anniversary of his crazy kingdom's founding. And how, you know, we're literally naked. Then we have to incinerate them. And then there's potential nuclear fallout. Because God knows what's going to happen if we take out the nuclear sites. And then there's the risk of retaliation. Then there's the risk that potentially millions of other people can die. You just got to you got to grasp this concept that there is evil. Now, on 9-11, we saw pure evil, but we also saw a goodness and a greatness in humanity that we'd never seen before. I mean, you think of the bravery of the firemen, policemen, first responders, volunteers. All these guys know the buildings surrounding them could probably collapse any minute. And they're literally on fiery rubble trying to find and recover people that still might be alive. And then the literally New York, not exactly known as the friendliest city in the world, every single person is uniting and, and literally 24-7. You know, I'd never forget Campbell's Soup opened up free soup for everybody, free food for everybody. And that went on for a while. And everybody got that we have an enemy and we didn't address radical Islam. We had ignored the coal bar towers ignored the embassy bombings in in Kenya and Tanzania. We ignored the USS Cole. We ignored the first Trade Center bombing, and we had to do something. You know, recently I was listening to Howard Stern's 9-11 program, and he's having, as usual, a great fun time, and then every minute it gets more serious and more serious and more serious, and I guess his program director, a station manager, comes in. Yeah, the, the Trade Center was hit. The second Trade Center was hit. Oh, yeah, the Pentagon's hit. Oh, a field in, in Pennsylvania. And you just know it's a terror attack. You know, and, you know, I, just, I don't even want to call attention to it. It's some politically incorrect things are said. And it's just like, you know, we've lost touch and sight of the fact that we do have enemies. And forget about the differences that we have. You know, we saw, like, for example, I'm going to show you looting video tonight. We'll give you examples of price gouging that took place in Florida. But that was the exception, not the rule. For the first time, I'm the biggest, you know, small government conservative that you'll ever meet. But government kind of stepped up and and both in Texas and Florida. And it was kind of cool to see state, local, federal government coordinating, having learned the lessons of Katrina and and other failed hurricane operations. And they prepositioned even Navy ships off the coast. I mean, the president literally called in the Marines for. Irma rescue operations. Thank God it moved west. The people cooperated. And then you get a few idiots that, you know, do things they never should have done. But the majority of people got it. State government, Governor Scott got it. Governor Abbott got it. You know, Pam Bondi got it. Dan Patrick got it. The White House got it. They prepositioned food, water, medicine, cots, baby formula, pillows for everybody. And they were ready to go. And thank God it just wasn't quite as bad as we thought it was going to be. All right, we got a lot of news today. We do have North Korea news. We do have news out of Washington. Uh, it is the 16th anniversary, 9-11-2001, the fifth anniversary of what happened in Benghazi. And we'll get to all of this uh, today in the course of the program. Kellyanne Conway will join us. Uh, Tonto Peranto, my buddy, one of the her- heroes of Benghazi. Dana Rohrbacher will join us and so much more. We'll get to your calls today as well, your memories and recollections. I want to take a, a minute today. Um, it's a tough day all the way around. I mean, it's the anniversary of 9-11, 16 years later. Benghazi, Tonto Peranto joins us later. Um, I, I want to ask you all to keep a couple of people in your thoughts and prayers, not only the people in Florida and Texas. Of course, we're, we're going to continue to follow through. Um, my good friend Eric Bowling lost his only child on Friday night. And um, I know how much he loved his son, as did his wife, and I can't think of anything harder, more challenging, more difficult. Literally, in the in the course of five hours, he he had separated with the Fox News Channel and was moving on. And and uh, Troy Gentry. So you know, if you can keep Eric Bowling in your prayers, Tr- Troy Gentry, uh, Montgomery Gentry, also uh, passed away at a helicopter accident late Friday. 
And Linda would not tell me during the show because rightly so. She knows that I, I just would have, I, I just have a hard time. I'm not the best person to deal with death. And it's just me. I, it's hard. It's the hardest thing you ever do. I mean, one thing I've learned in the course of my life, and I just, and I've been writing with Eric all weekend. And I just, you know, as I said, I don't know anyone that's had except, you know, all these parents that I've met over the years that have lost their sons and daughters. And I've just remember looking at them and thinking to myself, I, how do you go on? It's so hard. And they do, they endure, they fight through it. And, but there's not, it changes you forever. And Eric lost his only son. Troy Gentry had helped us with a lot of our freedom concerts and raising money. And just an amazing, talented, gifted, and, and generous human soul that I just had come to love and, and, and really like a lot. I loved their music forever. So in the course of your day today, as we pray for those military people we lost as a result of 9-11 and those that have been injured and the families that lost people on 9-11, and, of course, the families of, of the heroes of Benghazi, you know, please, I'd ask you to keep Eric Bowling and Troy Gentry in your prayers. All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll continue. This is the Sean Hannity Show. I got to give a lot of credit to the governor, state, local officials, again, just like in Texas, did an amazing job. Federal government was there. I mean, you know, to think that they had prepositioned everything people would need. The people of Florida listened. I know it went a little more westward than they thought. Oh, why did I leave? Because you're smart. And you don't want to risk your life. That's why you left. And you always err on the side of caution. This, this was a massive storm. And, you know, the president had even called in the Marines for Irma rescue operations. Uh, one thing I want to warn everybody about, the governor mentioned this, Jacksonville, Florida, WOKV, or affiliate down there. They're warning people in evacuation zones A and B along the St. John's River to get out because the river is at historic flood levels, likely to get worse right now as we speak. And so I think people are doing that. Um, it's still a tropical storm as it now heads north and still a lot of people are going to be impacted by this storm. Uh, we have yet to really get the true damage of all of this. Um, I, I love the fact that four Navy ships and Marines were redeployed to help the people in Florida and including, by the way, the main support force, the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit based out of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. All those Marines all sent down there all ready to help people. Seven million plus people without power in Florida as we speak. And uh, then, of course, you got the people that just, you know, just jerks. At least 32 looters arrested. We got some of that video we'll show you tonight. Thieves prompt a, a SWAT standoff in the middle of all this. Like this is what the this is what we need law enforcement to have, a, have to deal with. Joe Bastardi is with Weatherbell.com. Um, where does this rank in terms of storms that we have experienced in the country? Well, it's probably going to wind up in the top 10. As far as southwest Florida goes, uh, it did not beat Donna in 1960. You remember when we were talking on uh, on Friday, uh, we were, I was alluding to this thing uh, going down into Cuba for a while, and that certainly really mitigated the intensification process because not only did it stop it from intensifying over the Florida Straits, it also weakened it a bit uh, over northern Cuba, and then it had to start over again. So when it got to the Florida Keys, while it was a borderline Category 4 hurricane, it was not what it would have been if it stayed away completely from Cuba. And uh, so that that was a fortunate break. And the last part of the storm, it weakened coming to the coast. And what happens is if you look at the tracks of the 35 hurricane, I should have thought more about this. That storm weakened after it came to the Keys as it was parallel on the Florida coast because you get upwelling, that east wind that comes off in Naples, for instance, the wind's blowing out of the east, causes the water to cool a little bit, and there also is drier air coming in from Florida into the storm center. Now, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a relative term in that uh, they did not uh, experience the worst storm in southwest Florida history. Donna remains that, but this is still a top two or three storm where this hit and as well as uh, in the Florida Keys. You know, it's so funny. And um, look, we haven't yet to assess the true and real damage. And uh, I really want to get to that. They're actually, you know, have shown some of the, the Jacksonville footage on Fox. 
Um, you know, so you write me a note this morning. Now, this was a dead on hit. My, my southern home, which I never get to like a week or two a year, is down in Naples. And and everybody knows, so southwest Florida. And I just have friends and family down there that I just love. And so they're hit. And then you write me a really nice note today and say, oh, by the way, what is it? Hurricane Jose is headed for your exactly pinpointed at your house up in New York. I'm like, that's so nice well, of you, Joe. I really appreciate all the well, good no, news I, you're bringing I, to me. Day Friday, you you tell me, you know, one home is hit, and then my other home is hit the next day. Thanks a lot. Well, well <laughs> the, the, over kidding. the years, over the years, what I've done. <laughs> yeah, is, go ahead. Try I, and whiz, I, I, weasel out of that one. Well, well yeah, over the years, I've uh, told you, you know, a week and a half to sometimes a week. You know, it's Sandy. Ten days before, you better look out. As some of them don't work out, but I can identify threats when I can see it, and I can certainly see the pattern that's causing this. It, uh, it's in line with what we thought was going to happen this year. That's well, why look, we said but the major like this other heat. storm, Jose, is if you had to guess right now, you'd say it's on a track to hit the Northeast, specifically New York. That's in Long Island, no, right? No, if I, no. Here's what I say: it's going that's to what do it a loop. Like. It's going to do a loop and come back. Well, well, that's the. I just showed you the uh, the U.S. generated model, which interestingly enough is in the middle of the spread. The, uh, the there's a there's a huge window. I sent you that window this morning of uncertainty. It's very very big. It's from the Gulf of Mexico all the way into the North Atlantic. And what I do for for people is I put where I think the most likely track is, and it's in between to a point where. Yeah, it's going to, it's, it, we're going to have anxious moments. This is going to start back west Wednesday night or Thursday, and I think by Saturday it's probably a short distance off the northern Bahamas, and then we'll evaluate what the playing field is. What and now here we go again. This. So you're saying basically buckle up. This isn't the end of this. No, it's not the end. We're in the middle of the hurricane season, and it's supposed to be an active season. So uh, we, we, what's interesting is they're all really intensifying they're not intensifying right off Africa. They're waiting till they get further and further west. Irma right now is in southwest Georgia and it's heading into northern Alabama. It will not be like Harvey. We're going to have some big rains, but this is getting away from its source of mm-hmm. energy. And by the way, we have we may be having record-breaking cold right now in Alabama and Georgia. This big high in the northeast that's making it so nice in the northeast is funneling cool air and that air when when you rain into it uh, we get evaporation or cooling we're in the mid 50s in most of northern alabama yeah. and northern georgia right now with this storm so the tropical characteristics are rapidly being diminished and it's source right. of energy from the gulf of mexico is too all right joe you've been amazing the last couple of weeks and by the sounds of it we're going to have you back on by wednesday or thursday this week and the official meteorologist of the sean hannity show if you need information want to track with Joe Bastardi, a Hurricane Jose that could be hitting, again, the United States, uh, just go to weatherbell.com. Thank you, Joe. Say threat, Sean, say threaten, not hit yet, okay? So people don't no, you know what I mean. I mean, they don't yeah. get, I, I'm, wait, I have to be politically correct with the weather now. I mean, seriously, you know what I mean. Everybody knows what I mean, Joe. It's a, a Sean, it's yeah. a nutty. Can you believe this is what the world is today with all that stuff? You can't even say, uh, no. you can't even identify threats. You'll offend somebody identifying a threat. Okay, me. a hurricane hitting is not identifying a threat. I'm talking about, everyone knows what I'm talking about. All right, Joe Bastardi, weatherbell.com. Thanks so much for all your help this week. By the way, do you know there was um, White House Chief of Staff uh, John Kelly, uh, General John Kelly, fired back at a House Democrat who called him a disgrace to the uniform. Wow. Illinois Representative Luis Gutierrez leveled the criticism at Kelly over his support of the president's decision as to delay DACA for six months and let Congress get their act together. Anyway, Kelly responded by calling the Congress a do-nothing Congress and um, then went on to say, as far as the congressman and other irresponsible members of Congress are concerned, they have the luxury of saying what they want as they do nothing and have almost no responsibility. Love that. Good for him. So sick of these people. You know, I was watching Bannon this weekend, and I, I disagreed with what he said about Comey. I mean, you cannot have somebody that potentially is breaking the law and doing all the things Comey is doing. I don't think it was the biggest mistake by far. Yeah, maybe in retrospect we could say, well, it would have prevented, you know, special counsel Mueller from being appointed. But then he railed against, you know, the Senate and leadership, and it's it, it, he's right. You've got 14 weeks You know, the president showed that the government can effectively manage to do something well and right. He did all he he has kept his promises on regulations and things he can do. The appointment of a 
conservative justice to the Supreme Court or originals to the Supreme Court. And he's right about the Democrats, too. They just they suck. The only thing Democrats stand for now is we hate we hate Donald Trump. That's it. It's unbelievable. And I think, you know, he made a lot of powerful observations. And, (laughs) you know, it's so funny to watch Charlie. Charlie Rose does not understand what it means to be a conservative. Like one big, he spent too much time on his program interviewing New York Times writers. Um, interesting development: Jeff Sessions want the wants the NSC staff to take lie detector tests. I like that. You saw more football this weekend, and you saw you know the same thing we saw over with uh, Colin Kaepernick. And I'm going to tell you right now, people are just tuning out. They're sick of seeing it because Americans instinctively love their country. They know it's imperfect. Here's another thing. You got a so-called civil rights lawyer calling for Betsy DeVos to be raped. I'm not wishing for it, but I'd be okay if hashtag Betsy DeVos was sexually assaulted. What is wrong with these people? They're so twisted, ugly, and sick. Um, Anyway, we'll get to all this in the course of the program. We do have other information on North Korea. We have a potential with their anniversary coming up tomorrow of another ICBM launch, and how's the world going to react to that? No dark corner where terrorists can hide and saying America does not bend, waver, values endure, and from there we go on. Uh, Joining us now is counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway is with us. Kellyanne, thanks for being with us. And, uh, you know, when you think about 9 11, 2001, 16 years ago, and five years ago, Benghazi, and you know, the hurricanes and devastation yesterday, just the reality of life kind of hits you on a day like today. It does, and that's why all the pettiness and the peevishness really just has to be diminished in each of our lives. I would encourage people, not just today, but every day to reduce their social media examinations. Uh, Folks are getting ideas about who they are and and what we all believe based on, on nonsense from complete strangers. I mean, you can't let people define you in 140 characters or less, and this president likely agrees. I was really struck by the president's remarks. I mean, a consummate New Yorker who witnessed those towers fall in his hometown uh, from his perch at Trump Tower. By the way, I I want to interrupt you. I tweeted out two days after 9-11, Donald Trump was down at ground zero and did an interview, and I tweeted out parts of that. I don't know if you saw that. That's amazing. Um, well, he, you know, he's a New Yorker. He's always there to help. And I was also struck by the vice president's comments in Shanksville, Pennsylvania today, the site of Flight 93, going down with those uh, heroic passengers trying to take control of that plane. And Mike Pence uh, really getting emotional today as he recalled he was a freshman member of Congress and that he feels he owes we all owe a debt of gratitude to those brave men and women on that flight because that 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 plane was likely headed towards the nation's capital and and who knows god forbid what else the further devastation but it's a day we should honor obviously the fallen and their families shown and never forget but we should also really hold up and lift up so many profiles and courage so many stories of heroism and we see that again with the hurricane neighbor hurricanes neighbor to neighbor patriot to patriot stranger to stranger really the best the best of american america American spirit and Americans camaraderie. We don't see that all the time. I think it's just a day for reflection. You know, it's funny because we've been friends for a long time. And one of the things that I I agree with you on social media, it's so funny because I came to this conclusion just, I guess, a couple of months ago. I just said, you know what? This is never ending. And I I really think I'm good at the Twitter fights and nothing anybody says about me ever bothers me. I'm just way beyond that at this point in my life. And I just realized anything I have to say, I'm going to say it on radio and TV and I'm going to use Twitter. Twitter in a different way than I've used it before. And it's just a conscious decision because you got these people, I imagine the the keyboard warriors in their underwear with nothing else to do. And as soon as I tweet anything, it's it's on the left. It's these predictable, hateful people. And it's just all right. It's getting old. And the same with the I media know, people I, I fight with. Yeah, I've learned to pray for them all, really. And I'm not there. As I've even, as I've even told uh, the president and others with whom I work, you know, out of 100 people who approach me, 99 will say some combination, Sean, of tell the president we're praying for him or keep doing a great job or thank you for your sacrifice or tell the president we love him. And then people will say, 
say, look, I didn't vote for him, but I love my country. I want to give him a chance, or I think he's being treated unfairly. They don't even they don't even give him an opportunity to, to succeed. It's really 99 out of 100 people who approach me say things like that, and they're not all Trump voters. They're not all conservatives like you and me, but um, but they 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 love America and they want us to succeed. It's really the people hiding behind these social media platforms and nameless faces. And I'm thinking, what could have you so miserable in your own life that you speak this way about total strangers or, or you describe folks, you know, who have who have children or you describe children who have parents? It's just it's so it's so beyond comprehension for anybody who's happy and productive. And look, express your opinions, but disagree on policy. Don't don't insult people uh, personally. And, I, and you see so much of that on social media. And this is not about what's directed toward you or me or anyone else. We have very broad children. I'm just saying generally, I have to say you and I are raising children in these times. And it's it's just a, some of it's just a cesspool out there. But anyway, that's why we like to point out these stories of courage. And I was I was also struck by what the president said yesterday on September 10th, which is we're not talking about money right now. We're talking about lives. When he was asked a question about funding for hurricane relief, and we saw the devastation of Harvey, now Irma. People are watching uh, Jose uh, barrel down perhaps this week. And we just want Americans to know at the White House and administration-wide, Sean, that this is a president, a vice president, a cabinet, all of us um, who are praying for them, but also want to make sure they get the relief and the recovery funds that they need. And that when you look around the corner, that's when a lot of the rebuilding occurs, that we don't know what will face people. We don't know what the the losses in property and, and whatnot will be. But also people, when they lose their power, they tend to turn to other means of power. And that's when people get carbon monoxide problem. They, they poison, they turn on generators they hadn't used. And I was reading up a lot about that in past disasters where it's what happens after Mother Nature goes through. Uh, a lot of the devastation, God forbid, deaths happen afterwards. So people, don't let your curiosity get in the way of your safety. Um, if, if in doubt, just don't do it. Stay in the shelter. Go to someone else's home and just listen to those local authorities. I think this is where government functions best. Those of us who want a more limited, less active government have to appreciate the coordinated efforts of local, state, and federal governments when it comes you to know, it's things funny like you the, say the that. response. I started the show today, and I start. Listen, we I've known you for well over two decades now. We've been friends a long time. We've done a lot of TV and radio programs together. Neither one of us are big believers in in government, and especially big bloated bureaucracy and government as it's now developed into what it is today. And it kind of was refreshing between the two hurricanes to see Governor Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, uh, to see Rick Scott in Florida and and Pam Bondi, both friends of mine, and to see all the local authorities do everything right and coordinate with the federal government and pre-positioning food, water, medicine, supplies, and, and Mad Dog Mattis thinking this is going to be possible death and, and destruction, positioning four Navy ships. It just is nice to see it work. We've seen what happens when it doesn't work, i.e. Katrina. And it's uh, it's just refreshing because, you know, and now to follow up and take care of those people that are going to need help, rightly so. I, I mean, I just think it's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. And again, if people feel like they can volunteer their time, give a couple extra dollars, if they feel comfortable doing that, they should just look at the, again, go for the local or the, or the federal. They can access the information on any federal website. DHS has it up. FEMA has it up. American Red Cross, obviously. No, I'm not advocating for anybody to do that. I'm merely connecting people with information, which, by the way, Sean, is really, I think, first and foremost, the job of the media. I'm this loud voice in the administration for always talking about incomplete coverage. Please connect people with the information they need. It's because of technology, because of the forecasting, because of social media, because of multimedia platforms, TV, radio, social media, and elsewise, is how people are getting so much information ahead of time about evacuation, about the risks, about what to do and how to do it and how to help. It, I think it's mitigating a lot of these losses, and, and one death is too many and tragic. The fact that, we've, that so many losses have been mitigated here because people are listening and they're heeding authority and they're taking the word of their governors and their mayors, and they're not saying, which party do you belong to, and should I trust you? Just listen, err on the side of caution. And I, and I we just have to say that as, as they try to clean up and recover, because that's when a lot of these problems happen. But you remember 9-11, there was a feeling of camaraderie, a great deal of confusion and consternation and grief, but that a lot of camaraderie and coming together, and we haven't seen that. 
that in quite a while now. And, and for all these people, all these detractors who say, oh, the president keeps missing opportunities to unify the country. He's been doing that a lot lately. And maybe he's not getting the credit and, and the visibility for it that he deserves and that people need to see. But he's been taking the lead. Leaders do this when a country or people in different states are suffering, are hurting, a country is remembering, grieving. Vice presidents go to Shanksville. Presidents go to the Pentagon. They, they do what the, what the nation needs. Um, and I think it all begins at the top with leadership, and he's showing it. Well, I, I agree with you. All right, we've got to take a quick break. More with uh, Kellyanne Conway, counsel to the president on the other side as we continue the Sean Hannity Show. What did you think of the New York Times piece? Because I know a lot was made over the fact that I was a little shocked that the Republicans last week were ill-prepared to go forward with the debt ceiling. They had just been off pretty much the entire month of August, and the president wanted to get immediate aid to the victims of Hurricane Harvey, so he expanded or extended the debt ceiling for three months, and a lot of people are angry. The New York Times headline was, Bound to No Party, Trump Trump uh, ends 150 years of two-party rule. Now, people ask me all the time what I like about the president, and it's like he keeps advocating everything he said on the campaign trail with no deviation that I see, and that the president wants the economic plan, the energy plan, the border wall, uh, conservative justices. I don't see any deviation except that, right. you know, he's trying to get things done. And I see a party not prepared to move at the speed of, of anything at this point. They're looking at this through an ideological prism where they should be looking at it through the, the facts of disruption and that Donald Trump said he's going to come to Washington owing no one anything. And that frees him up to keep those promises. And you see at these rallies now, his biggest applause lines are still his program. Drain the swamp, repeal and replace Obamacare, cut taxes, put ISIS in defeat, American exceptionalism, invest in the military, respect the first responders, fight terrorism, keep us safe and secure, secure our borders, build the wall. It's all there, Sean, and it's never changed. The uh, the fact is, he wanted to make sure a couple things happened last week. One is that the aid and assistance get to those hurricane victims as soon as possible, and that's before Irma hit. This is about Harvey even. Number two, uh, that he wanted to he wanted to make sure that we ha- that he has room in the legislative agenda to get things done between now and December when the, when the three month CR would run out. And those who want to negotiate for a longer one have a, have more time now to make their case. Those who want to get rid of the debt ceiling have more time now to make their case. But in the interim, he's still talking about building that wall and getting the funding this year. Tax reform very much in our sights. We feel like we can get it done in the next ninety days with the right help. Hope so. He he certainly. You know, there's just so much to do, uh, and he also wanted to keep right. his options open on military spending. So this is a president who leads. He governs the way he ran, which is I'm coming to make a change. um, And people just, you know, people in the swamp just can't get used to it. Kellyanne, thank you for being with us. Thanks for all you're doing as well. I know you're working hard every day, and we appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Sean. This is a fairly volatile situation, and it is in response not to United States policy, uh, not to, obviously, the administration, not to the American people. It is in response to a video. Some have sought to justify this vicious behavior along with the protest that took place at our embassy in Cairo yesterday as a response to inflammatory material posted on the Internet. We can all condemn this reprehensible video. It was a crude and disgusting video sparked outrage throughout the Muslim world. Now, I have made it clear that the United States government had nothing to do with this video. But were any of these U.S. military personnel not permitted to travel on a rescue mission or relief mission to Benghazi? They were not authorized to travel. How did the personnel react to being told to stand down? They were furious. Where'd that message come down? Where'd the stand down order come from? I believe it came from either Africa or South Africa. Movie opened this weekend. It's called 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. It's a cinematic version of a nonfiction book telling the story of the six private security contractors who defended the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya, uh, from an attack by Islamic militants. Are you planning to see it at all? I'm just too busy campaigning. So I'm kind of raising up in a crouched position, starting to shoot. And as I do, I see Tyrone's in a fetal position at my, at my left and my feet. And his gun's gone. He's not shooting. So he's out of the fight. I turn back to start shooting, and as I raise my left hand up, I realize that um, from about six inches above the uh, wrist, it's kind of hanging off at a 90-degree angle. Some of the family are still very distraught. One of the mothers said that she still feels all this time Mm. that she has not had sufficient answers. How do you relate to her as a mother? Oh, I totally relate to her as a mother or to any of the family members uh, of the four Americans who were killed that night. My name is Patricia Smith. 
my son Sean was one of four brave Americans killed during the 2012 terrorist attack at Benghazi. Sean was a wonderful son and father to my two amazing grandchildren. That night, we lost sons, brothers, fathers, and husbands. We lost four brave Americans who made the ultimate sacrifice for the country they chose to serve, and the American people lost the truth. I blame Hillary Clinton personally for the death of my son. I spoke to her at the coffin ceremony, and she told me what she told me within about five feet of my, my son's coffin, and she lied to me then. The fact is, we had four dead Americans. Was it because of a protest, or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? It was the worst attack on our country since Pearl Harbor, and even worse because this was an attack on civilians. Innocent men, women, and children whose lives were taken so needlessly. For the families with us on this anniversary, we know that not a single day goes by when you don't think about the loved one stolen from your life. Today, our entire nation grieves with you and with every family of those 2,977 innocent souls who were murdered by terrorists 16 years ago. Each family here today represents a son or daughter, a sister or brother, a mother or father who was taken from you on that terrible, terrible day. But no force on earth can ever take away your memories, diminish your love, or break your will to endure and carry on and go forward. Though we can never erase your pain or bring back those you lost, we can honor their sacrifice by pledging our resolve to do whatever we must to keep our people safe. All right, 23 now till the top of the hour. Toll free, our telephone number is 800-941-SEAN. 16 years since 9-11-2001. And five years since Benghazi 2012, 9-11. Joining us now, Chris Tonto Peranto. Now, he was one of the heroes of Benghazi. Saved so many different people and, and lives. And he was one of the people given a stand-down order and recognized immediately that, well, we had nothing to do with the YouTube video. It was nothing but one huge, massive, big lie that this was never a spontaneous demonstration. It never made sense anyway, because who shows up to a spontaneous demonstration with mortars and, you know, rocket, rocket-fired grenades in their back pocket? Never made sense. This was an attack, a terrorist attack. It was from the get-go, and they consciously, we learned later, it was a, a, just an outright lie. And, you know, you heard some of the family members say they were just lied to directly to their face by Hillary and others. Uh, so anyway, Tonto Peranto joins us. Congressman Dana Rohrbacher of California is with us to talk about his experience, personal experience with 9-11. And he was warned in advance that there would be a signal of an imminent attack and the assassination of his friend and and the tribal chieftain, Mossad, uh, two days before was that signal. Anyway, he made an appointment with Condi Rice at the White House to warn her. Alas, the appointment was the morning of 9-11. Anyway, guys, welcome uh, to this program. We're just not going to stop thinking and talking about it because I know that other networks have moved on. I I haven't seen anything near the coverage we've seen in years past. But Congressman Rohrbacher, I had not known this story that that there was some advanced signal that you knew of and you were acting on it. Well, I had been involved with the uh, uh, Mujahideen and their fight against Soviet occupation. So I had friends there and I'd been working with... uh, various tribal leaders to try to offer an alternative to the Taliban. And so I got tipped off that uh, there was a a major terrorist attack being planned, and I assumed that the CIA knew that. If I was, quote, why didn't they? And uh, then uh, uh, they said it would follow a major major event in Afghanistan. And when Commander Massoud was murdered, uh, he was one of the great anti-Taliban leaders. I'd gone up there to meet him. In the, in the Panjir Valley, he was also anti-Soviet leader, and they murdered him. And I knew at that point, they said, 
if if they killed him then, it was so that we could not retaliate against them by helping him. And I said, well, I forget if that's the way it is. This is going to be one hell of a terrorist attack. I tried to warn everybody, and uh, quite frankly, uh, I, the day before, I sort of felt like William Shatner on that airplane in, in Twilight Zone. Nobody would believe him that there was a monster uh, trying to destroy the plane. So, why, why did uh, you think that this was the sign, though? Why would the, the assassination of a tribal you know, chief be, be a sign to you or a signal to you that something big was going to happen here? Yeah, he was sort of the, 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 the warlord of all warlords, the chief of all chiefs. He was, a, one of, he was the only leader in Afghanistan at that time that posed the real threat to the Taliban. And uh, the guy who, who anyway, the, uh, the tip-off that I got was at a high level from someone who had helped me during the wars against the Soviets, who was then a Taliban leader. And I, I, I believe that uh, the CIA must have known. By the way, what we're talking about now. Oh, you believe the, the CIA must have known. Was, whoa, whoa, slow down. You believe the CIA yeah. knew that 9-11 was happening? No, I believe the CIA that this is one of the biggest screw ups in the history of our intelligence community. And afterwards, after this, we end up with what you're commemorating today also, which is the right thing to do, the politicalization of our intelligence community by the last administration, especially by Hillary Clinton. And, uh, and we, you know, we see that even today, the politicalization of our intelligence community, who's trying to tell us a big lie, again, just like Benghazi, the big lie. And the big lie today is, oh, it was Trump colluding with the Russians that, right. that before, uh, stole the last election. Before I get to Chris Tonto Peranto here, and uh, he can wait. Even he's a friend of mine. You know, he's you know he's he's not exactly our favorite guest. I'm kidding. He's one of my best <laughs> friends. Um, but, <laughs> He's our hero. He's our he, hero. Nah, he is. And, and by the way, he gives me a much harder time than I ever give him. So I feel defensive and I need to strike first. Um, but, Congressman, I, I really want to – are you – because this is very, very important. We, we know that there was no coordination with the FBI and the CIA. That was supposed to be one of the things that we fixed. I agree with you that there's we've seen no evidence of any – type of collusion between the Trump campaign and this Russia issue. Russia has tried to influence elections in the past. They tried in in this election. They'll try in future elections. That's all been testimony. Nobody has given us any evidence of any collusion. And you believe now that there's a 99 plus percent certainty that it never happened and there's evidence that'll prove that. That's correct. And remember, uh, what we're talking about today again is the, the our intelligence services were politicized by Hillary and Obama, and that's why five years ago, uh, with the when 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 our guys were on the line in Benghazi, they were betrayed, and now uh, that so that shows you when they went along, when the intelligence communities went along with that phony story that there was some uh, these people were just mad about a video that was done uh, when when obviously this was a major terrorist attack commemorating 9/11. And, but our intelligence committees backed up Hillary in that, and now they are backing up uh, the you know the former president and Hillary, saying that Hillary didn't lose the election; it was stolen by collusion between Trump and the Russians. Again, just politicized intelligence. It's wrong, and it needs to be exposed. All right, both of you stay right there. Chris Tonto Peranto and Congressman Dana Rohrbacher, as we continue, 800 941 Sean is our number. Really good friends over the years. When you guys first saw the coverage and you first saw them blame this YouTube video as it relates to Benghazi, and then you knew a stand-down order was given because it was given to you, and you saw all the lying that was told about this— what was your first reaction when you saw it? I, I, I was actually uh, just woken up in Germany. The uh, then a couple of days after we finally got to Germany out of Tripoli, and I, I, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't upset, but I was. Uh, that's pretty much what I expected. It, it was it was that kind of reaction. Was I, well, I expected that. I I thought for a second, man, I wish they could have come up with something a little bit better than a video, they, and that was that was it. It, it, and I think that even says even more so of how how much uh, corruption there was in D.C., how much corruption there was even within the agency itself, was that I fully expected them to cover it up. But I just figured they could have thought of a better you know, story. I mean, it's sad. Did. I mean, it's sort of like heading into these two hurricanes. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like, eh, you know, uh, are they going to screw this up? And 
as I was yeah. saying at the beginning of the program, and, and it's kind of nice once in a while to see the government can get something right, and they had actually pre-positioned water and food and medicine and supplies and baby formula and cots and blankets and, and, and pillows, my pillow, I hope. But in all honesty, I mean, you know, for two hurricanes in a row, they actually had their act together. It's pretty amazing because like you, I just – my expectations – are not high, and you expecting them to lie is so typical of, I think, the, the, it's yeah. the opinion that most people have because governments earned it. Let's put it that way. And they, and they do. And, and what we did, and by, first of all, the heroism, of course, by Tyrone and, and Glenn and sacrificing their lives to save others, but by the team standing up and saying something outwardly, publicly, and saying, no, they are lying, this isn't correct, this is what happened, um, I, I really feel that, that we, we, uh, we started to show the American public, hey, you know what, we're exposing this corruption that's going on in D.C. This is happening all the time. But this incident in particular, where an ambassador died, and they still want to try to cover it up, and they left us to die. Hillary All these Clinton. people died, Hillary. and you were at the annex. And how many times were you told to stand down, just in case there's any ambiguity? We just played the tape of both the, the president yeah. at the time, Obama, and Hillary Clinton. And Hillary still hasn't told the truth, except that, you know, what difference <laughs> at this point does it make? Which I think became a, a big issue in the campaign. And that, that still disgusts me. It makes a huge difference when you leave your, when you leave your guys to die overseas when they're fighting for their lives but three times two weights one stand down and we're not even counting the stand down orders that were given to the military when they were trying to come and help us so uh, you know the multitude of stand downs uh, we're just we just disobeyed orders and and did the right thing and because of it we lost our security clearances which is basically we were fired for doing the right thing but that was that was what needed to be done you always do the right thing no matter the consequences and we did it yeah you know i think of the iranian deal and i look at the bad clinton deal on north korea and i actually wrote a friend of mine today who lost a very close relative a brother on 9 11 and i said i just i can't believe we still don't understand radical islam and you look at these deals and you got to think, boy, we really can be stupid. All right, guys, we got to let you go here. Dana Rohrbacher and Chris Tonto Peranto, my two good friends, thank you for being with us. And uh, uh, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day. All right, there you hear all that's happening, the aftermath, obviously, of what's going on uh, post hurricane. Joining us now, Pam Bondi, the attorney general for the great state of Florida, as well as from Samaritan's Purse, the Reverend Franklin Graham is back with us. Fra uh, Reverend, welcome to you. Pam, welcome back to you. Um, it looked like it turned out much better for the state than we originally thought. But we still have a lot of damage that occurred, a lot of people's lives upended. It's going to take a lot of money and, and resources. Where are we right now in terms of the effort to get people back in their homes and, and certainly helping people that have had such great damage that they can't go back to their home? Well, Sean and, and Reverend Graham, I want to tell you thank you for all your prayers because prayers work for Florida. You know, when, when people were texting us from all over the country, we said, please pray, and prayers worked. Um, but right now the damage is extensive. Sean, I've been at the EOC Emergency Operations Center in Hillsborough County all morning working with personnel there. I just landed in a law enforcement helicopter. We had flown up. I'm trying to send your station some photos of that. I mean, just complete homes underwater. But for the most part, um, we were really blessed. The, the, the thing right now is getting power on. I've been on the phone with Rob Bennett, who's CEO of Tampa Electric, and of course, Eric Salaji with Florida Power and Light. And they're bringing trucks in from everywhere, trying to get power up and running for our state. Hospitals are priority, then shelters, of course, and then folks' homes. But, um, but really, it could have hit us a lot worse. But even um, if you're familiar with Florida at all, Anna Maria Island, it's a small bridge that goes over to Anna yeah. Maria. Um, it's opening up again for residents. So the way the winds were blowing, and, it, you, know, you know, I'm from Tampa Bay. I've never seen anything like this on my, in my life. On Bayshore, the Bayshore, it's, one of the, it's the longest sidewalk in the world, actually. And Bayshore, the Tampa Bay, the wind had pushed the bay away. The bay shore had become a sandy beach. Tampa Same bay. thing happened to some extent in Naples, too. Literally, with the, yeah. the beach was never as big as it was, and then in comes the surge. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Sean, if I could just mention, too, uh, when I left the Emergency Operations Center, I want to personally thank the Red Cross. Um, they, they have 
I mean, throughout the state, there are 580 evacuation centers, 258 of those are run by the Red Cross, and um, hundreds of volunteers for the Red Cross all over our state. And, you know, if people want to donate your viewers, you know you're safe going to redcross.org. Well, uh, you know, I, I always I've worked with with Franklin over these many, many years, and uh, and I've always donated a Samaritan's Purse. Reverend, you have no clue, but I did send a donation after Harvey. I will send a donation and, and send some money over today or tomorrow for the people in Florida. Before I get to Reverend Graham, how much do you think the damage is? Do you have any estimates now? It's going to be in the billions, obviously. Sean, it is, and, and we don't know yet. Again, we're still assessing it as far as areas that are safe to get back into. Um, it's actually, you know, safe for law enforcement now to get back into the Keys even. We could have taken a worse hit than we did, but, you know, I've lived here my entire life, and I've, I've never seen anything like this in, in my lifetime. You know, now, of course, we look for different scams going on and, you know, the, the predators who come in to prey on our citizens but um, it's, it's, it's really been something else. But, but I can tell you it's federal, state, local law enforcement, our National Guard, FEMA. The White House has been incredible, giving us the resources we need. And, and, and Governor Scott has been out there tirelessly working, you know, spreading the word. And, Sean, I think the fatalities were so minimal because so many people chose to leave their homes and heeded the warning. So that, yeah. that was a very positive thing. I know. And some people say, oh, why did I leave at the last minute it moved westward? I mean, thank God it moved westward. Uh, Reverend Graham, good to talk to you again. Um, what I've always loved, and I had the blessing once of going on a trip with you with Samaritan's Purse, and for years I've, I, I support your efforts and Operation uh, Christmas Child, and, and you're still in Haiti. You never give up on parts of the world when other people have long forgotten it. And I know you have a big team down in Texas, and I assume you were staging people before Irma to head down to Florida. And I know that I know that Samaritan's Purse is going to be uh, up to their eyeballs in probably years of help and assistance and work. We are, Sean. We've got uh, two teams uh, that are in Florida now. They'll be set up in Fort Myers and in Naples this, this evening. And, uh, and, and Sean, we'll be there for, for weeks uh, helping, especially people that got flooded, because that's that's the, that's the mess when a when water comes into a home. You've got to be able to get all the wet things out, let the house dry out, and that just takes time. Uh, but we're also working, uh, Sean, in, in the Caribbean. We're at St. Martin. We went in Thursday, just a, a few days after the hurricane hit. We had a DC-8 in there with 80,000 pounds of plastic. Um, we've taken generators in there. The, our DC-8 was back in there yesterday in the St. Martin. Uh, we've got a team set up. We're setting a distribution center up at San Juan so that we can go to Antigua, Barbuda, and some of these other uh, islands that have smaller airstrips on them. Um, the World Food Program uh, took, uh, I think it was 60,000, uh, uh, excuse me, they took in 60 tons of food into Port-au-Prince in Haiti, thinking the storm was going to hit there, and it didn't. Uh, they have asked us to move half that food for them, which we're going to do, and take that to St. Martin and to, and to uh, Antigua. So we're, we're going to be busy, Sean. Uh, the islands uh, really got smashed, and it's going to take years for Did them to Did you see Barbuda? Back. 95% of dwellings destroyed, just wiped out. That's right. And we're going to go to Barbuda, and we'll be in there this week. Uh, with uh, Unfortunately, most of those people uh, have been moved off the island, and they've gone over to the main island of Antigua, and they're in a stadium there. Uh, and that's where the World Food Program wants us to get this food to them, which uh, we'll, we'll have that food in there, I think, by tomorrow. And to Antigua. But it's a, Sean, it's uh, anytime a storm like this comes, it's a mess and it just takes time. And all you can do is, is get on the ground and start working and figure it out as you go. If you wait at home to try to figure it all out, you'll never get there. You just got to go and start, start the process. When we went into uh, St. Martin last Thursday, uh, the airport wasn't open. We landed wow. and um, there were a few Dutch Marines and they were surprised. What are you guys doing here? We they helped us unload yeah. the airplane, and and we started taking. We took Jonathan Falwell of all people. He was down there. He's a great uh, guy. Jerry Falwell, Love him. Son, we got yeah. him out of there. It's the anniversary, the 16th anniversary of 9/11, 2001, the fifth anniversary of Benghazi, and that was 2012. And and then we had the hurricanes. First Harvey, now Irma, all over the weekend. And it's still, by the way, you know, headed towards, you know, areas in Georgia and. And Alabama, as we see, uh, speak, and into Tennessee, I think. 
And we saw the the worst in humanity, an unspeakable evil on 9-11, Pam. And then we saw the best in humanity, the firemen, the policemen, the, the first responders, you know, all of the community, you know, feeding those guys and, and everybody, you know, coming together in ways we've never seen. The same with Texas and the same that happened, you know, in Florida. Everybody's working together, but then you always have you know, darkness and evil. And you had people that were price gouging, which really ticks me off, and selling bottles of water for 40 bucks a case. And other people, apparently, I saw the videos of looting. We'll show it on TV tonight. Um, what are you going to be able to do in, ter- in regards to these issues? Well, and, and you're right, Sean, and to always start off, we see so much more good than bad, like you said, and we're seeing it now. If, if you could have seen the Emergency Operations Center this morning, all the folks volunteering and Reverend Graham, everything that you're doing, it's unbelievable. But, yes, you know, and now we get a whole different group of price gou- of gougers, Sean, the different people, and, frankly, a lot of them are coming in from other states to prey on Floridians. They're coming in, and and folks, if you live in Florida and you're listening to this and somebody's coming up to your door and they want you to to, um, use them for contracting services and they want you to sign something to assign your insurance benefits away to them, don't do it. Talk to your insurance company first. Get quotes, get itemized things. Do not be paying people, especially people who come knocking on your door, any money in advance at all. And again, our, our hotline is one eight six six nine no scam As far as the looters, um, I can tell you that law enforcement will be out in force everywhere, and we, we will show looters no mercy throughout our state. I'm so He's glad to hear that. We have videos of them. All right, stay right there. we got to take a quick break. Uh, Franklin Graham, Samaritan's Purse. We have a link if you want to help the people in Florida or Barbuda, and you can earmark it any particular place you want to earmark it, uh, as is normally the case with uh, Samaritan's Purse. We'll have more with Pam Bondi. Pam will be on TV tonight. We'll show you this looting video. It's going to break your heart, considering everybody was working together, and state, local, federal government actually coordinated and did a good job for once, which is refreshing. You know, after seeing Barbuda, that scared the living daylights out of me, Reverend, with 95% of dwellings knocked down. Now, with your contact with some of these smaller islands, do you know how many people died in, as a result of this hurricane? No, Sean, we don't have that information yet, and I'm not sure uh, the local people have that information. It is, um, it looks, uh, Sean, like a like a war zone, um, like an atomic bomb or something went off. It just it flattened everything. Uh, even the steel uh, reinforced communication towers were, were blown over. So it's going to take a long time for these these islands. But whoever was affected by the storm, Florida, the islands, uh, people need to know that God is not mad at them. Some people ask me. Uh, and after a storm, I think he's just mad at Hannity wrong. because Hannity's the biggest pain in the <laughs> neck he's dealt with in a long time. Well, I tell you, God <laughs> loves us, Sean, and I want the people of these islands to know that God hasn't forgotten them. He hasn't turned his back on them, and that we're going to do everything we can to help them and to help them not only just get through this, but to help them get on their way again. And that's that's what's so important. And that's why we need volunteers. We have, in Florida, we will be able to, to use about four to 500 volunteers a day. And, these that's, volunteers, and people, by the way, are vo- going, yeah, and people are volunteering. A lot of people volunteered after Harvey, right? Yes, and we've got a lot of people right now in, in Texas. Uh, and if, if you call and if you want to volunteer, if the number's busy, Call back. Um, but we're going to need volunteers, not just for this week or next week, but, Sean, we'll need volunteers into next year um, that we're willing to go in and work in these homes and help people, especially those that don't have insurance. That's what we focus on. Uh, we focus on the elderly. And we also, uh, for, for, for military people who are deployed, and are not able to come home, of course, uh, we want to be able to help those families and be there for them because they're overseas defending us. We want to be yeah. able to help them at home. So we're yeah. going to we make them a high priority. I don't know. Every time I, I hear that, it just brings me back and just it just sobers you. You just stop. You remember. You can't even believe that we've been through this trauma. And then we've just got to ask ourselves, how you know, where have we gone from? The, how did we just give Iran? billions and billions and billions of dollars especially we're finding out north korea has nukes and now they have icbms (laughs) i'm like okay 
Bill Clinton told us, oh, we're going to give them billions and they're not going to have a, a nuclear weapon. They're going to get rid of all their nuclear stuff. And, and this is a good deal for the American people. Well, it wasn't a good deal, nor will Iran, through the prism of history, be a good deal either. And we'll literally look back and realize we funded their nuclear program. And when you hear what happened 9-11, 2001, you just got to you just got to say how the, the, the level of stupidity and ignorance is beyond breathtaking. Anyway, 800-941, Sean, our number. Let's get to our phones. Let's go to Nancy is in Fort Lauderdale. Wasn't hit as bad as we thought. Thank God. Nancy, glad you called. Well, Sean, I'm not in Fort Lauderdale. I got scared and I got the heck out of there. I am a Andrew survivor. And at uh, midnight Wednesday night, my husband said, you're not going to stay for armor. You're getting in the car. So I loaded up my daughters, my granddaughter, and uh, one suitcase, and off we went. And I Good for you. By the way, well, that was a you. smart thing. That was so smart. Oh, you don't know it. But I wanted to thank you because we were listening to you in the car, and we're going to start heading home tomorrow, and we're going to listen to you again. But I also want to thank God for giving me the mercy to get and the strength to get out of there for protecting everybody and doing what we had to do and for him to protect everybody in the future to take care of us for it is. And I want to thank all of America. You know, when we pulled into a Taco Bell in Kentucky, the man saw our license plate and we placed our order and I gave him his $20 for our meal. And he gave me back $20 and change, and he said, God bless you. Just people all along the way were coming up to us and telling us we're praying for you, we're praying for you. But also I want to thank President Trump, Vice President Pence, uh, the FEMA, that cute guy, Brock Long. He is so cute to watch on TV. Uh, <laughs> Attorney General Pam for going after the ones that are scamming people. And Rick Scott. When you run for president, I want to work on your campaign. He has done an excellent job. When I was in Andrew, I had to wait weeks for my electorate to come on. I had to wait weeks for a National Guard to come down and help me dig out my, my belongings, my home, clear the roadways. I am under the impression now from Facebook friends who stayed down there that that stuff is going on right now. My husband is a hospital worker. Therefore, I knew he would be safe. My son-in-law stayed at home at his house with all the animals because we can't leave our animals down there by themselves. And he, we heard from him this morning, but I have not heard from my husband yet. And I know that's because he doesn't have any signals or any electricity or anything like that. And I'm good with that. I feel good about that. I know he's okay. But the other thing that was, was very important coming up from Florida at the time that we did with the millions of people, other people was that we were seeing all the electrical trucks, all the army people, all the cops. Wasn't that amazing, by the way? I mean, oh, I, I, I was crying. We were beeping our horns and waving at them. And then my granddaughter says, Nana, why are you acting like that? And I said, when you get home, you'll see why. Glad you got out. 800 941 Sean. Sean is in Palm Beach, Florida. Hope you're doing well down there. You got hit a lot less than Southwest Florida. What's going on in Palm Beach? Yes, I'm very thankful because I also am a, a, a Hurricane Andrew victim who lost my house. Uh, My house was completely destroyed with shutters, and I lived a half mile from the ocean, and I was within the eye wall of Andrew. So I know better than anyone when when the governor says to evacuate, and I am so, so happy that that he put so much emphasis on people getting out. And uh, because even with shutters, I was in an evacuation area. My home was destroyed. Glass went through tile floors. Uh, shutters had tiles go through how, how close are you to the shore? Uh, I was a half mile from the ocean. Yeah. And uh, here in Palm Beach So all Gardens, this happened, I, and you, you were riding this out. Yeah. Well, we uh, I evacuated. It was my parents' house. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I just have to say. Listen, this is the thing. If you think of... And I'm only looking at my own life and and 
I just remember when I got my first home. It happened to be in Roswell, Georgia, a number of years ago, and I remember I was the happiest guy on earth. And on earth. I paid one hundred twenty-three thousand dollars, and it had like an acre, and it was at the end of a cul-de-sac, and it was a dream house for me. And every single person I know, for the most part, their home is their biggest investment, and it literally is your life in that home in this way. That all those hours of work, all those years of study, you know, it's a it's a culmination of a life's work. It's a culmination of your life and for most people and for those people for example in texas that never dreamed that they'd need flood insurance their homes everything they work for is gone we can't forget about texas you know because those people are going to need help and the one thing i i think the president was right last week when he made the deal to extend the debt ceiling because paul ryan and and mitch mcconnell for whatever reason this is this is mind-numbing to me, didn't come back from their August recess with a plan on the debt ceiling. And so he's like, all right, I'll extend it. Um, I just think we got to, I don't understand the lack of urgency. These people need their homes rebuilt. The ones that weren't asked and it wasn't demanded of them to have flood insurance, you know, it's one of those things that could happen to anybody. And I think there's a, an adequate role for the federal government and the generosity of the American people. We're not going to let people's lives be upended to the point where their lives are ruined. To me, it's just not fair. And I'm not talking about fairness and that we fundamentally have to have fairness in society. We, we've got the ability to take care of that. So, um, you know, it's sad to hear these stories. But anyway, you get the final word. Go ahead, Sean. I'm glad you're safe, though. That was the um, most important thing. Thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd also like to say it was interesting because I'm I'm inland this time around. Um, I, I live on uh, PGA National around the golf course. And the canal behind the house, when the winds picked up and I was able to see out the back window is we had several tornado wind uh, warnings, which is really scary. And the winds, let me tell you, I mean, it felt like a, a cat five. And I guess the winds did pick up to about 100 miles per hour around here. But we could see the water in the canal literally be picked up out of the water. And and the same thing happened with, with our, our swimming pool. It was really, it was unbelievable. And um, I had a lake in front of my, uh, in front of my street. And I mean, my neighborhood, somehow they, they drained it. But, um, but it was really incredible to see that. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just very fortunate. And my heart goes out to those who haven't been as lucky as I have. And mm -hmm. um, also, I'd like to say, Everyone, please remember 9-11. May we never forget. May we never forget. Have you forgotten, my, my good friend Daryl Worley? Anyway, Sean, hang in there um, and help us on the way. What, you know, I love what we saw. I, I actually, I don't praise government very often. But, I mean, you have the Coast Guard. I mean, in the wake of these hurricanes, they did amazing work. Um, you look at, for example, what happened with... You know, General Mad Dog Mattis, he's like, all right, let's get these ships positioned over here. And then everybody pre-positioning everything that they're going to need for food, water supplies and everything. The people in Florida, we predictably knew that they would need. Um, anyway, so to me, it was a big it, it, it's just nice. The governors were amazing. Abbott and Governor Scott were amazing. And we literally saw the best in people again. And I know some people are like, oh, you made me leave. And then the storm switched its path. Nobody can predict that. Bottom line is, it was still one of the worst storms. I think it was top seven ever. And and it's extraordinarily dangerous. And when you're talking about gambling with people's lives, if I'm in government and my job is to give people my best counsel advice, I would never for a second regret, not one bit, telling people to err on the side of caution. And the people of Florida responded. Good for them. I was very proud of them. And, you know, but for the looters and those people price gouging, everything went pretty smoothly. And I know there's a disruption in everybody's life and it's a pain in the you know what, but better that you're alive and you get back to your normal life. Hopefully the majority of people and then those that need help are going to get the help.